So I, I wanted to say that uh, with, the, with science and technology, the way we want to embrace it will give us an opportunity to harness the environment, but also to be able to maximize productivity, uh, creation, creativity, and innovation away from uh, uh, degrade, degrading the environment. I want to submit that um, um, abusing the environment, degrading it, has really nothing to do with the big population. It has much to do with the quality of the population that we have. Mm. So we have to up our game in terms of building skills, uh, empowering the population to be able to engage, harness the environment, and not abuse it. Because if they don't have skills, that's when they will now go and cut down the trees, uh, burn the forests. But if, if we build, equip, and skill the population, they will be able to harness, sustain, and even improve the climate and the environment. So one of, a few of the most important government interventions and policy dimension that people may not actually realize we are dealing by harnessing the environment is to have the UPE program, the universal primary education, so that we, we get the young people off the natural setting to classrooms, to go to school, to grow skills so that everybody has an education or a skill to survive on, but not the environment only. And if you are going to use the, the land and the environment and the water, you are able to use in a professional manner, in a, more that is, in a, a manner that is more skilled than the, the, the traditional one that is causing soil erosion. I come from a community that suffers the environmental uh, hazards. Uh, I come from Bugisu. You hear that every year we have mudslides in Ibududa and the neighboring areas. That's not very good news for my community because we lose people and we also lose a good environment. We need to get back to survive the environment and also be able to harness and be innovative but using scientific uh, methods. So I wanted to say that uh, when you get, for example, girls longer in school, that means that you don't have anybody producing for you at the early age of 14 and 13. So when we have our game on education, you'll have this young girl from my community uh, finish her education maybe early at the age of 23 through tertiary institutions, and by the time she has done with school, she has some level of skill. She will not climb the mountains or the slopes to go and till the land, or by that time she will not have had 11, 12 children who must survive on a smaller garden, which is now degraded. So the, the delaying of fertility by having girl children in school is helping us to be able to build for the future, but to have skilled women and men who will be able to have children okay. by choice, not children by chance, or by, not children by fertility. So I, I hope I've been able to answer this. So okay. education is so key, skills building is very key, and being able to go out with a campaign to grow forests, like uh, uh, Dr. Mgisha is saying, this is not a campaign for only national planning, uh, national forest authority, it is for all Ugandans, for everybody. Why don't you celebrate your birthdays by planting a tree? Why don't you celebrate your marital days by planting trees? Mm. I come from a, another community. We culturally, we circumcise uh, the males. Every even year, why don't we plant trees in the old year so that we, for every boy that we've circumcised, we say, for this one, we planted 10 trees so that we are able to get back the environment that then will work for the future of our country. And the, finally, the government's policy and campaign is that we are going science and technology. Why? because the future is tech, so that we are innovative and we get off the land and be able to use the other skills uh, to survive. Okay, as you thank close you. in. All right, thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the questions, I'll come to you. Um, Roz, you had a few questions coming in, especially how ready you are as young people to get on the negotiating table. I request that you use the shortest time to answer those and you could as well give us your closing remarks 
Uh, thank you, Midred, and thanks for the question that came in. And what I want to assure you is that young people are ready. We are more than ready to take up opportunities. And we've been looking for opportunities. We are still looking for opportunities. We just need support. We just need to work with all partners and the government and policymakers as collaborators. And uh, for example, I always say that the challenge with the cultural kind of context is that in the African culture, generally, usually it's the old people that talk and they make the young people to shut up, just sit down and listen. What do you know? We need to dismantle that system. We are in a new generation. We are facing different and challenges compared to the challenges that were faced a few decades ago and generations ago. If you are solving the current generation's problems, including climate change, then probably you are not on the front line like the young people and the women and the children are. So that's why we need to be part of the problem solvers and part of identifying uh, the challenges and solutions. And the other thing I wanted to also answer was Edwin's uh, question on uh, young people engagement in, in the National Water, I mean in the Environment Week. I think what we need to do right now, we understand that the NOC has actually put across the board, the youth board, and what we need is support from the partners. We need to have like a fund that could actually continue the work that young people are doing from tree planting, from debates, from rising climate change awareness. As part of the climate week, I mean, uh, as part of the water week, what's an environment week, but also beyond that. So the young people, the climate movement in Uganda is stronger than ever. We have different activists. We have different organizations from Youth Go Green, Rise Up Movement, Fridays for Future to mention, but a few, we are ready to take up these spaces. And the other thing I also wanted to mention uh, was to date a countdown, 15 days to the to the launch of the, uh, the NEMA, NEMA penalty scheme on, uh, on environmental breaches. I'm just warning everyone here, if you're not ready to pay, if you're not ready to pay for those penalty breaches by just throwing your waste everywhere, littering, please stop, stop before that happens. From the 1st of April, it's not Fool's Day. <laughs> so if you don't have the money to pay, for that penalty and you continue littering and you continue drinking your water and throwing garbage out of your beautiful cars, oh, please don't. And um, also I wanted also to add on that uh, this sector on environment and water concerns all of us at, at, as I had already mentioned. We know it's not a role, it's not completely up to individuals, but individuals have a role to play. Behavior change, mindset change is very key. And that is why we need programs. Young people are already leading these programs, but we need support from the government and other sectors. And uh, and of course, not forgetting, this is the UN decade of, um, uh, of ecosystem restoration. What are we all doing on that? I always carry my water bottle. I just refuel, rarely buy bottled water. I can't say I never buy bottled water, but I rarely do that. Uh, I walk with my bag uh, that I use to do my shopping. So such small changes could be also helpful, but it's not the main, those small changes will not change the whole system. And that is why the implementation of policies and acts and legal frameworks need to happen. And uh, yesterday I was speaking somewhere and I mentioned that we need to come to NEMA, ministry. Why is it that implementation, there's a very big disconnect between the policies on paper and implementation, and how can the young people help to ensure this implementation happens? And one thing I also recommended is like, let all, let all of us be stewards of the environment. You see someone littering, you see an organization uh, throwing influence all over in the wetland and everywhere, you see their laying gravel in the wetland, just inform NEMA, just inform the environmental police, the social media list, used our social media to reach to reach as many people as we can but also we need to go back to the grassroots and i'll be really interested to see next year i hope next year i'll be able to attend in person seeing more grassroots people women groups in the villages there coming being part of the water week and you know showcasing their work because they're the ones that are the front line of the climate crisis so 
let's use our social media. Let's use all the digital tools that we have. Um, I use Twitter most of the times, and uh, you can, Nema is always on Twitter trying to follow up on the cases that people report. And uh, lastly, I would also want to say that, uh, just to add on the population, I have an unpopular opinion. Population is not the problem. It's the lifestyles. If you look at an average person in Uganda and their consumption level compared to uh, people in the US, you, you understand that population is not the main problem. So it's the lifestyles, it's the dysfunctional systems, the failure in policy implementation. But again, I cannot say like population is completely uh, out of the of the of the of the mathematics. We have to model and see and identify what solutions. Urban planning, also considering that people will be migrating more from villages, especially due to failure of agriculture and increasing droughts, and uh, also recognizing that we shouldn't blame climate change on everything. There's a flood in Kampala, we are blaming climate change. The problem is with poor urban planning, poor waste management. They, the channels are always clogged. When the water comes, what will happen? Okay. So, and um, I'd like to end by saying that we have the power to change. We have the power to put Uganda on a map as a sustainable country. The emerging cities, footport of where I come from, I would expect such emerging cities to do much better than Kampala in terms of urban planning and green spaces. And uh, and also for the policy makers, the leaders, the private sector here, I'm just going to emphasize the young people of Uganda are ready to work with you. We just need capacity in terms of, you know, how to do financial reporting, how to write proposals, how to negotiate. We need that capacity and you have those skills and we can all deliver solutions for our environment. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose. Back to you, uh, All right. Thank you very much, Rose. And I'll just put a rejoinder to what you said earlier on. Even when you have the money to pay the penalties, please don't throw out rubbish in here. Okay? You, because you could throw and when a police officer comes, you say here is the money because you asked for a penalty. Let me go to Professor Stephan as we get to wind up this. Any key issues that were raised in our plenary that you want to respond to? But also I would like to ask... Um, how do you think some of these issues that have been raised can be addressed by the water and environment sector and how you as the World Meteorological Organization can come in to support because we were earlier talking about uh, partnerships. Thank you. At this stage, it's difficult. You know, you feel everything has been said already, so what can I add? But to answer your specific question, I would like to say that from the World Meteorological Organization, the UN organization specialized in the field of meteorology, climate, and water for the environment, um, we're really looking forward to work with the stakeholders in Uganda. In my first intervention, I briefly spoke about this early warning systems. I think that's one field where we really um, see collaboration and feel we can we can really help uh, the country and the region to, to uh, sustainably develop. Furthermore, all the work that we're always doing in terms of data, data infrastructure, data management to support the, the, uh, the statements Rose and others did, you know, we are more of the larger water resources sector, not on the um, Water Supply and Sanitation Act. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Migushu might will, will speak on that. But um, uh, in, in the kind of large of water ecology link to climate and meteorology, I think we have a lot to contribute. Data collection, data management, data availability, but also services, forecasting, uh, probabilities, suggesting uh, alternative ways for developing resources uh, sustainably. I think that's what we're working on. And if I may give one example on what we are working on for Lake Victoria, high emphasis also on for Uganda, is the system called Hydro SOS, Hydrological Status and Outlook System, where by integrating the latest data, the best models that, that we can find, and, and obviously always in close collaboration led by, by local, local experts, 
uh, integrating the latest data, the latest models into assessing the status of the hydrological system, but also making seasonal to sub-seasonal prediction. So how will the water resources situation develop in the coming weeks and months? And I heard one of the speakers is a Ugandan organization that works on, 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 the, on these forecasts already, very much looking forward, collaborating with them, thinking about the critical capacity building that WMO offers to strengthen further, further the capabilities and, um, and also facilitating exchange of data and knowledge uh, within the country uh, by different stakeholders, but also between the countries. No news that uh, Uganda is, is, a, is a critical country for um, uh, cross-boundary uh, water collaboration uh, in the Nile Basin. So therefore, if we can, we can be of assistance there, we would be delighted to do so. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Professor Stefan. A round of applause for him. And um, as we get to our physical participants, here, I'll start off with you. Uh, I'll start with the Rotarian, uh, Dr. Sebalu, on um, how the water and environment sector can solve some of the problems together with looping in the partnerships. Uh, for example, from the Rotary that you talked about earlier on as you give your closing remarks to. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there are also a few issues that came up that Please. we may be able to uh, share thoughts about. I think um, this demonstrates that um, one statement that I want to make uh, for the record is that water and environment is too important to be left to government alone through its ministries departments mm. and agencies. Mm. It is too important to be an issue of lamentation for the rest of the actors. So we all have a responsibility, both state and non-state actors, to play our rightful role in our civic spaces. So you don't need permission to participate in matters of the environment. I wanted that to be a statement on the record. Now, we are making some interventions like Rotary, as I indicated. We are working with schools, we are working with communities, and we've come up with interventions that help other government programs to thrive. For instance, when you talk about UPE, how do you keep girls in school if you are not providing uh, water and sanitation. So these are interventions we are making for purposes of ensuring that the retention rate is high and the completion rate is high. Therefore, you are able to achieve the set objective of transforming society using education as a tool of transformation. And you need to appreciate that these are interlinked. They are cross-cutting. And that's how we do our bit. As Rotary, we are involving the young people and we are engaging the young people. We have what we call Rotaract. Those are between the age of 18 and 30 and they are very active. Actually, among the partners that were listed here is the Rotaract Club of Kampala Central. They are mm. part of this, this whole agenda mm. and we have them around the entire country we have over 200 road truck clubs, and they're doing and implementing projects in WASH, projects in the environment, and they're really doing good. But we also have those in school whom we call interactors, and many of them are also having projects uh, to do with the environment. As a District 9213, District 9214 in Uganda, we also have a mega project on the environment called the Mission Green, and we are planting trees across the country. We've so far planted over five million trees collectively. Just this weekend, there is a Rotary Club, which is called the E Saturday Jazz Rotary Club. They've secured 10,000 seedlings of trees, and they are going to have them planted in Soroti. And we are doing that being mindful of what kind of trees we plant. We are putting emphasis on fruit trees so that we are able to synergize. We protect the environment, 
but we are also handling matters of diet and matters of food uh, as a consequence. So one thing that I want us to take seriously is that uh, let's not look at the weak. This is the message to the ministry, the departments and agencies. Let's not look at celebrating the weak, commemorating the weak. Let's be full time. Every single day, every single week, every single month of the year must be given attention like the one that has been given in this week. Okay. So with that, we should be able to build a critical mass of the population that is conscious, that is aware, and that is responsive in engaging the needs of our communities. Okay. I want to close by saying that many of you are doing good things in your different spaces. And I want to say, you can be many good things in this world, but as long as Rotary is not one of them, you are as good as incomplete. Ah. <laughs> so I want you people to be complete. On top of the very many things you are doing, put on Rotary so that you serve humanity, because in Rotary, we have amazing people who are doing amazing things in amazing ways to generate amazing results for our amazing communities. And environment and water is one such that we give due attention. Thank you very much for your kind attention and indulgence. Thank you so much. I think you weaved it when you talked about humanity and how we need to serve humanity because that's what we live for, what we normally call Ubuntu. I want to come to Honorable Wanyoto here with your closing uh, remarks and what role you think National Planning Authority can come together to play uh, with the water and environment sector. Uh, thank you. I think Dr. Sevalo should pay for this important advert. Yeah, yeah, we'll give the invoice after. Dr. Carlos is preparing it. But, but thank you. Um, you. You pay the bills. The, the National Planning Authority, as uh, a national planner, works with all sectors and all stakeholders. And I like the idea to say that um, this conference is very important because it took us back to pay attention, to take stock of how we stand as a country in terms of water and the environment, but also to realize that uh, it's a survival. You don't have to be told that you are going to, to die. This is our survival. It's so important that it cannot be left to government structures alone, to the national planning, because it's a government national planner. or even on a border border and you've drunk water from Renzoli water and then after you have, you have taken the water then you throw the bottle outside the car window and then that bottle finds its way to the drainage because it's plastic then it will clog the drainage like my sister from Uganda Kingdom has said then you find floods then you say these floods is because KCCA has not done this work but it begins it's personal it starts with you so the back ends with us in our homes. Where are we, how are we managing the waste in our homes? Because we, we all go to the shops, we buy all sorts of stuff in the kitchen. How are we managing the waste? How are we managing the medical waste in terms of uh, people who are running health centers? Uh, we have a lot of uh, civil society organizations who are doing a lot of commendable work in terms of the environment and also awareness campaigns, especially in settlements which are not planned. And uh, we want to commend them for a good job they are doing. We have uh, people who are working with international agencies, whether they are local, localized, like I've heard about the one million international tree plant in the suburb of the court, Dr. Jabril. The campaign is on. So let us all do our work. The National Planning Authority Op runs an open door policy. Please come and we share our experiences. We don't want to have a, a national plan that is on a shelf there or on a website and it's not working for people. Okay. So let's have an integrated agenda. Uh, we invite you to work with us and to celebrate the achievements, but where we have not done well, we also go out and correct uh, the mistakes. Please do not hesitate 
to challenge us so that we can plan better for the country. We exist so that Uganda is better planned in a sustainable and integrated manner, and it is for you at individual level. I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Anyoto, for the Open Door Policy and National Planning Authority. And finally, uh, let's have Dr. Silva Mdisha with your closing remarks, but also just what more can be done in the water resources sector, natural resources sector. And I loved when Dr. Sevalu talked about the fact that we don't have to wait for the water week alone. We need to continue with much more. Thank you very much, Midred. First of all, I national water drives a water for all agenda. And the Ministry of Water and Environment is our parent ministry. So there are very, very key areas where we intersect with the ministry. The climate adaptation, climate change adaptation, is an issue that touches all of us. Not only national water, but I think National Forest Authority, NEMA, all the institutions under the ministry. Environmental protection, water resources management, and efficient water management. These are topics that the ministry is championing, and that is where national water comes in very, very closely. The thing that the Ministry of Water can do for us, Midred, there's one thing you may not know. Mm. We have a PS who is all round. The PS is uh, almost a jack of all trades, and that is normally very, very key in leadership. Mm. And for us, it is creating for us a very good enabling environment. Uh, it helps the coordination role to be played very well. And it also he has helped, he has helped the technical side to continuously put on table very useful knowledge and information. And I think that is what, what this gathering has helped to do. If you read the key take-homes, you see very useful information there, and that is as a result of, 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 of strong leadership. And therefore, that forms part and parcel of the overall incentive framework that the ministry is providing to National Water, and I'm sure to other sister institutions. And for me, if the ministry can continue to do that, that will help any serious institution from continuing to play its role, from continuing to deliver on its mandate. Thank okay. you very much. All right, uh, round of applause to our panelists. And uh, I don't know whether it was political that uh, Dr. Amjisha had to throw uh, praises to the PS who is here. <laughs> and this is your ministry, PS. But we'll take all the applause because whatever he said is actually key. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for participating. A round of applause to yourselves and to my panel right here, who I am going to allow to leave the stage. Uh, right about now. Uh, please feel free to leave the stage. And please, like, uh, Mildred, it is a don't, Friday. Don't allow them to leave without a photo. We oh, want yeah. them there. There is evidence that they were here. And I will request And Rose that, remains uh, in the background. Exactly. Yes. Uh, the digital team is going to ensure Rose appears in this photo. So our panelists, please stand. Please stand. Uh, and, uh, this time not so, so socially distanced as they, they were doing. Yeah, please. Not uh, so closer. Distance. Closer. Get closer. Uh, so and, I ask, request maybe the PS and the uh, PS if you could join them since yeah. you or their host. Uh -huh. And also, no, um, Morris, yes. since it's a Friday, yes. Dr. Mujisha reminded us yes. that as you think about buying that beer, yes. multiply or divide by how much jerry cans of water. <laughs> <laughs> Those could have actually been. All right, so we will take that uh, memorable uh, commemorative picture before we can get to live. Yes, Morris. All right, um, we really need to put our hands together. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for Mildred and the panel for doing a good job. And I want to invite Dr. Kalist. Please, panelists, remain. Uh, panelists, please remain, because Dr. Kalist, I think, will start with the panelists, right? Uh, oh, yeah. We have a couple of awards before we move into the closing ceremony. Um, allow us recognize our panelists. Whoever has our awards, please bring our souvenirs. We have the souvenirs for the panelists. So please I think Dr. Kalist will begin with the panelists since they're already here. Uh -huh. uh, thank you very much. Can we get to the awards, please, very fast? So we have a few awards that are going to be given out. And we have different categories. We are going to start with the panelists. 
and uh, the awards to the panelists are going to be given by the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Water and Environment. Can we get the awards, please? So we are going to get the Permanent Secretary to give awards to the various uh, people. We start with the panelists. So we start with the Honorable Lydia Wanyoto. Can you bring the award for National Planning Authority? It will be followed by the award for National Water and Soil Corporation, Dr. Silva Mugisha. So get ready, team, with the awards. <laughs> National Water and Soil Corporation, Dr. Mugisha, the award will follow. So let's give the PS an applause for doing that. Then we shall have an award for Honorable Mike Sebaru. Honorable Mike Sebaru. Then the people on the line. We'll have the people on the line. Rose Kobusinge will get an award. I would like somebody, a young person, to receive an award for Rose. She's on the line watching. Can we get a young lady? One of the students, one of the student ladies, come forward and receive this award. And Rose, I hope you are seeing a young lady whom you should mentor to be like you. So thank you very much again for being part of the panel. And Chairperson, Uganda National Meteorological Authority, you can come forward and receive the award for Professor Stephen Unbrook. I don't know whether he's still around, but he, uh, you can pass the other side, the chairperson. Chairperson, Ghana National Meteorological Authority will receive the award for Professor Stephen. Uganda National Meteorological Authority represents Uganda on World Meteorological Organization Board. So thank you very much, chairperson. So let's give an applause to PS for doing this. We are going to have some awards given to the youth, those who have participated in the debates. Can I request Edwin very fast to come forward? And we would like to request His Excellency, the Deputy Ambassador of EU to Uganda, to come forward, His Excellency Graeme Chatrin, to come forward and award our youth. Edwin, where is Edwin? OK. Come and tell us what, what it has all been about, and then the youth will come forward and be awarded. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalist. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Edwin Mhomza, um, the team leader, Youth Go Green, but also the chair of the Youth Subcommittee for Water and Environment Week. Colleagues, uh, Water and Environment Week gave an opportunity to the young people to participate in the national and regional youth debates. And uh, we've done uh, regional debates. We have been in the north, we have been in the west, we have been in the central region here, but also we have been in the east. And uh, under the youth uh, subcommittee uh, engagements, we looked at universities, secondary schools, and primary schools. And the purpose of this is to have a platform for the young people to speak about water, environment, and climate change, and what they think about all our natural resources altogether. We gave them a chance to do research, what they think about what could be done, what procedures, initiatives that they can come up with, but we put it in form of a debate. So since 2019, we have had an opportunity to do uh, debates across the country. However, of course, there are challenges here and there, and that's why we're calling development partners to support this engagement, because it gives young people an opportunity, a platform, to ensure that, that the young people out there all get involved in this space and actually talk about all related issues that concern environment and natural resources. Now, we, for instance, in the West, the West is split into two, uh, according to the Ministry of Water and Environment decentralized offices. We had the Southwest and the Arbatine. For the Southwest and Arbatine, 
uh, Mbara University of Science and Technology was the best, was the winner for the Southwestern region. Can we clap for them? <laughs> the Albertine region also had the Finns Medical University taking for the Albertine. Can we clap for them? <laughs> However, because the region is big and we wanted to get the overall winner for the Western region, again, these two winners faced each other. And I'm really excited to mention that Finns Medical University, again, was the best for Western region. <laughs> and actually, they are here. They qualified for the nationals. Can, we, can you stand up for recognition? Medical Finns, Finns Medical University was the overall winner for last year's Western region youth debate. So can we clap for them once again? Thank you so much. That was for the category. For Eastern region, we had one debate. And we had a number of universities, and I am happy to mention that National Teachers College Kariro in Kariro District was the best. If they are here, or they have already gone back, but they were here for yesterday's grand uh, uh, finale for the national uh, debate tournament. Of course, for the northern region, I am privileged to say Gulu University was the overall winner. Can we clap for them? And of course, lastly, Makere University took for the central region. Thank you so much. I am also happy to say that uh, yesterday we had an opportunity to have the finals of the National Youth Debate Tournament and Water and Environment Week. And for the university category, we were happy to have Makere University taking it again. So Makere University, could you please come up here for recognition and award? Is there anyone from Makere University? The students, where are they? Okay, they are here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Makere University, you're coming here. Um, for the secondary school category, we also had regionals at a regional level. I will start with the Eastern region. Eastern region, Amos College School was the overall winner for the Eastern region. Can we clap for them? Also, Gulu, I mean Gulu, uh, we had the Gulu Army School as the university. Maybe just hold on before you hand it over. I, let me just mention all this, and then we'll definitely give them. Uh, then for central, for central region, and also the western region, again, Mary Hill High School was the overall winner. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for the secondary category, for yesterday's finals, we had Mary Hill High School take up this. Can we recognize them? Can we have Mary Hill High School come here? Maybe the MC will help us start for the university. We can officially hand over the award, Makere University. I would request, if possible, the Mr. P.S. could also come here. If it's, no. if it's allowed, it's not. OK. So could you please hand over the award to Makere University? Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The girls at uh, Mary Hill High School was the overall winner for Western Region. A round of applause for Mary National. Hill. Thank you so much. Uh, on the same, of course, we normally give them uh, certificates for recognition. Um, and I think it's also on the same opportunity that they can stay behind. You can stay behind. You Mary receive Hill? a certificate. Yeah, we will have a certificate to okay. this. This is uh, the winner for secondary school category. So they will be also getting their certificate. Makere Investor, you may come back here for your certificate also. Quickly. This is it. Ladies and gentlemen, we had the first runners for the Youth Debate Nationals. Can we have Finns Medical University come over quickly? Big round of applause, Finns, quickly. please, as quickly as you can be able to come here. OK, as they come, could also, we could also have the first runners for the secondary school, the high school category. And this is Amos College School all the way from Bukedia. Can we clap for them? Ah. Could you please come over and receive your certificate? Let's get Finns Thank Amos College, so please. That's, uh, get closer. That's Finns. Finns. Smiles. Smiles for that. Here it is. Huh? Okay. Um, lastly, 
course, we had the best speakers for each category. Let's first of all get the and secondary school uh, runners up. Yeah, the secondary school. And most college. Yes, the most yeah. college. All the way from Bukedia, really. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, yes. And on the same note, before they go back, we had the best speaker for this debate category, and this is Mr. Beyonjera Bright. If you're among the three, please come back and receive this certificate. Beyond Bright, Bright is Finns Medical, yeah, Finns Medical University. And then, of course, we had the best speaker for the secondary school category, Miss Atkunda Patricia from Mel Hill High School. Our upcoming MPs and, and gentlemen, this marks the end of the award ceremony for the youth debate, and we thank the ministry, we thank everybody for supporting the youth engagement. We appeal to the government partners to give this process a very good support. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, congratulations to the winners and uh, may you keep and, winning. And thank you very much, Your Excellency, for performing this function. We move on very fast. We had the hackathon and I would like to call upon Yvonne, come very fast and tell us what it's all about. But we are going to have His Excellency. His Excellency. UNHCR representative in Uganda, Matthew Quincy, to come forward and give us this award for the hackathon. So, can you take us through this very fast? Thank you very much, Dr. Palist. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yvonne Lugali, the World Sustainability Manager with Water for People, and I'll quickly do this. So this year, as part of a pre-event activity, we had the Work 23 University Hackathon that had uh, a total of seven universities, a total of 54 students taking part across two days. And uh, what a hackathon is, really, is a, well, it's a creative problem-solving event where you have students give them a challenge, they think through the challenges and they're able to develop innovative solutions to these challenges. And so, of course, on behalf of Water for People, Water Resources Institute, uh, WWF, the World Meteorological Organization, we want to say that we're extremely proud of all the students. And so after the two days, we're able to have uh, the winners for this event. And I'll start with the second runner-up, and that's uh, a group called Alman from Barra University. Please come up quickly. So Alman was, uh, their solution was on low-cost household grey water recycling in Barra, Uni in ba Barra City. Yes. Congratulations, Team Alman. Okay, and then the first runner up was a team from Busitema University, and their team name was Street Smart. Please come up. And their idea was the pretreatment and reuse of mercury in the wastewater from the gold mines in Busia district. Maybe I can also mention this team actually had two universities, that's Busitema and Barra University. Yeah. And then finally, we had the winners for the University Hackathon, a team called the Ultimates that had representation from Makero University, Kampala International University, as well as Uganda Management Institute. 
and their solution was real-time monitoring for deforestation and water pollution. Team Ultimates, please, please come up here. Yeah. And as well as an app that they called Aquawood. Yeah. Also getting a plaque, yeah. Yes. So congratulations to all the teams. We're extremely proud of you. Thank you very much. We would like to thank all our partners, Red by Water for People, for really taking us through the hackathon. Very, very interesting. Uh, we have an award for one of the partners that has been with the Water Resources Institute since its inception in 2018, WaterAid Uganda. And we are going to invite the head of Mission Austria Development Corporation to come forward and give an award to WaterAid Uganda. Uh, Water Aid in Uganda, they, ha they have uh, an event that is going on, so I'm going to ask the request the country director IRC and the country director Water for People in partnership to come and receive this award. Water Aid Uganda has a strategy, a country strategy, and the Water Resources Institute and the Uganda Water and Environment Week is part of their strategy. Annually, we have funding from them for holding the Uganda Water and Environment Week. For six years running, they have been supporting the Water and Environment Week. And on behalf of the ministry, we would like to recognize them and give them an award. The country director is not here, but fellow country directors, Jane and Brenda, are going to come forward and receive this award on behalf of Water Aid Uganda. And also, Water Aid is also supporting the female mentorship program of the Water Resources Institute. And the ladies who graduated yesterday. So thank you very much, Water Uganda. Thank you very much, Head of Mission. Thank you very much, Country Directors, for receiving this award. Final awards are going to the regional offices of the Ministry of Water and Environment. And I've been requested my, by my boss, the Permanent Secretary, invite one of the winners, the lead winners of either the youth debate or the hackathon, two lead winners, one from the hackathon, another one from the youth debate, come forward and award the regional offices with the Minister of Water and Environment. So the ladies, the young ladies come forward, are going to award the regional offices, are going to have the office in Lira, the team from Lira, and you come forward, those who are representing the regional office in Irira come forward and receive the award. Let's get the team from Wakiso, get ready. The team from Bale, please move very fast. The team from Fort Porto, the team from Barara, the team from Moroto. You know there are many activities going on, so we we'll get representatives. I want to call upon colleagues to come forward very fast and receive this award. So this is, she's representing the team from Lira, the regional office in Irira. Give an award to Office in Lira. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this. You remain here. Can we get a team from Bale? Come forward. Team from Bali, for those of you who are not aware, the Ministry of Water and Environment has uh, region six, uh, six regional offices, and we are awarding the team for very good work done to celebrate the Uganda Water and Environment Week. So thank you very much. Bale, let's get to Wakiso. Do we have Wakiso? Yes, let's award the, the regional office in Wakiso. 
him representing region office Wakiso. Thank you so much for the good work you have been doing. You are helping the ministry to deliver services to the people on the ground. Fort Porto. Let's get the team from Fort Porto. Team from Fort Porto, come forward. Okay. All of these regional offices have organized prevent activities. They have had marathons, they have had clean up exercises, football matches. Thank you very much, team Fort Porto, for the good work done. We continue with the team from Barara. Team from Barara as we wait for the team from Moroto. For the team from Barara, the regional office, want to thank you. We had whole week activities, activities covering the whole week before the Uganda Water and Environment Week, bringing uh, on board stakeholders. Thank you very much. And the Moroto team, I know the Moroto team had visitors there, but can we get one staff from the ministry to receive an award for the Moroto team? Somebody to receive the award for the Moroto team. We don't have staff from Minnesota Water and Environment at all here. Somebody to receive, yes. And this will mark the end of the award giving ceremony. And I want you to join me to thank all of those that have made it possible to have these awards. We have financial contributions that have been made to make this award ceremony successful. People have put in a lot of effort. So Moroto team, thank you very much. And our young ladies, thank you very much. We thank you and wish you all the best. So let me invite Mildred and Morris to continue with this function. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want us to put our hands together for all the winners and all the participants. I think it's a very difficult job for the organizing committee, uh, first of all, after a week-long activity to just recognize a couple of people um, who are participating in all the activities. Um, and I see we forgot to mention, for those of you who are not here on the opening ceremony, uh, we had walkers from the Albertine region, and I see one of the walkers is still here. If we have any walkers in the room, please stand. Uh, they walked over 320 kilometers. You received your certificates when you arrived, so don't ask for for them here. So we don't have the certificates here with us, uh, you, because you already have them. So ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin now the formal closing ceremony. So I want to take uh, the singular honor and pleasure of inviting uh, the deputy head of delegation at the European Union, Mr. Guam Chartan, to come and make his remarks. That's how you pronounce his name in French. <laughs> And please note, that's not the spelling of the name. If you check the spelling on your document, you will notice that I've done a fantastic job. You're welcome, Your Excellency. Congratulations, Maurice, for saying my name rightly. Yeah. I know you hold beer to all of us, so I won't be long, I promise. Um, Mr. Pierce, um, honorables, dear representative from the ministries, uh, from the parliament, members of the organization teams, panelists, youth, uh, member of the private sectors, colleagues, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today closing the Water and Environment Week uh, at the Ministry of Water and Environment. Uh, and I want to express my gratitude on behalf of the Ambassador Jan Sadek, who could not be with us today, uh, and on behalf of the Team Europe for giving us the possibility to address this audience today. Uh, this says a lot about the partnership we have with the Ministry, this partnership that we have built together for years and that made the EU and its member states the first and strongest partner of Uganda on water and environment. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Rizda Kremser, uh, who heads the Austrian Development Agency, underlined during the opening ceremony the relevance and the importance of this event, and she demonstrated as well the strong commitment of the EU member states to 
to support Uganda in the water and environment sectors. Um, it's always difficult to take uh, the floor in the last days. Uh, we want to reflect on the take-homes, but I will take uh, the recommendation of uh, our wise elephant uh, to, to go on the constant. Um, you know, often our cooperation programs, they are dictated, dictated by joint interest and pragmatic approach. But I must confess that when it comes to working on water and environment in Uganda, uh, it's also driven by a form of fascination and a sense of moral duty to engage, to protect together such an environment that you received as a Ugandan. And we feel privileged to be your partners uh, in these sectors. The eye of the observers is fascinating by the rank of swelling foam and leaping water. The hear is attracted by the rough music of the river's fierce play despite the terrors which the imagination paints to watch the smooth flowing surface on the lake suddenly broken into furry. There is a charm too in the Seine which can belong to few such for this outflowing river that the great Victoria Nyanza discharges from its bosom become known to the world as the White Nile. Those words were written by Henri Morton Stanley discovering the beauty of Uganda in April 1857, uh, 75, sorry. And almost 150 years after this, the fascination for Uganda's wonderful natures has developed into robust ambitions and strong commitments in our joint development cooperation agenda for its preservation and protections. Uh, I feel humble when I talk about commitments that we refer as partners to money. Uh, when I hear that during the week we had people running marathon, uh, running in Jinja, walking 300 kilometers. I mean, that's, that's another form of commitment and probably a stronger one, actually, I must say. Um, but beyond Uganda, the engagement of the European Union to protect and preserve the environment and to fight against climate change and environmental degradation is at the core of our engagement, is at the core of the European Green Deal and the center of our partnership agenda globally. And as the president of the commission say, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen, uh, we must look beyond Europe's borders. We must explore new forms of global cooperation on green finance towards a climate-friendly economy. Europe will be the first climate-neutral continent, but we do not want to be the only one. And that's why we are committed to support our partners. W what are those global commitments taken by Europe? Well, this is reducing gas emission to at least 55% below 1990 levels by 2030, and it's coming fast. And it's to, and it's to becoming climate neutral by, 2000, by, 250, by 2050, sorry, by 2050. The Green Deal agenda adopted by the European Union aims at boosting the efficient use of resources by moving to clean circular economy and to stop climate change, revert biodiversity loss and cut pollutions. The Green Deal outlines investment needed and financing tools available and explains how to ensure just and inclusive transition. The European Green Deal covers all the sectors of economy and is again is at the center of our cooperation with partners. And this ambition we want to share it with, our, with the African Union and the African partners. During the last EU-African Union Summit uh, in 2022, we adopted also the Global Getaway Investment Package, which aims to support a strong, inclusive, green and digital recovery and transformation for Africa. We're talking here of 150 billion euros investment from the EU, its member states and the financial institutions, but also by leveraging private sector investments. The, course, the, the, the aim is, of course, to mobilize resources and to reinforce EU-Africa's dialogue on these issues and to address the biggest challenge of our time, the climate crisis. For Uganda, this commitment has translated into a reinforced cooperation, notably on issues related to green, green and climate transition. Concretely, this led to the development of a new phase in our cooperation, in forestry in particular, where we're going to adopt, when we are just adopted a 40 million euro program. And our, part, our member states here in Uganda uh, are contributing much more to that. Uh, Austria, Italy, Germany, France, Sweden, 
island, notably, are among those partners. Beyond this, Uganda was amongst the first five countries in the world to sign a forest partnership with the President of the EU Commission at the last COP in Sharm el Sheikh. Uganda was represented by Right Honorable Kadaga, the first Deputy Prime Minister. This forest partnership aims at reversing deforestation. Through it, as partners, we are reaffirming the long political commitment and intention to cooperate closely to ensure forest management, generate economic transformation, reduce deforestation, and look for ways to facilitate production and trade in legal and sustainable forest products. This partnership will help us to do more and to do better. More conservation, better reforestation, more engagement with community, in particular those who have the ancestral knowledge on how to protect the environment and its heritage. We, we were in Kisoro a few weeks ago with the, with the EU homes and we met uh, the Batwa communities from there protecting the forest in the, in the Kishoro, in Gainga, Etchuya, uh, and Buindi. And I think that's our communities that need to be engaged because they have this knowledge. I mean, they have been protected for centuries, the forest, and we need to tap into this knowledge uh, as we move forward. The European Union is also supporting Uganda to improve its capacity in climate finance. Uh, we touched the subject today, and I think that the establishment of a climate finance department at the Ministry of Finance, uh, Planning and Economy Development is an important first step uh, on this matter. And in addition, I want to stress the importance that we are giving to bringing the financial sectors. This was also addressed today uh, on board and advocating for a stronger role of this private sector to promote green investments in Uganda and elsewhere. But what will be the cooperation on, env on environments without the cooperation on the water sector? And now I have to add, and women and youth. Um, in Uganda, the cooperation between the European Union and Uganda is global and comprehensive when it comes to water, manage, water, water sectors. We talk about partnership on transboundary corporations, what to water treatments, and water and sanitation services for refugees. But I know that Matthews will, will address that uh, after me. Uganda has long acted as a moderator of the downstream upstream dialogue in the Nile Basin, hosting the Nile Basin initiatives for more than two decades. At about three weeks from the 22nd Nile Day celebration in Nairobi, uh, and just a few days until the New York Water Conference, I wish to commend Uganda's commitment to promote cooperation in the Nile River, Nile River Basin. On water sector as well, I want to commend the major achievements that were made over the past few years. As an example, the water treatment plant in Katosi that helped serving the needs of all population in Kampala that was inaugurated one year ago uh, with the French Agents for Development and the contribution of the Dutch, uh, of the German, sorry, uh, Bank for Development, KFW, and the European Investment Bank, and of course, with the partnership of Uganda government and the National Water and Sewerage Corporation. And as I was mentioning, uh, our cooperation in the water sector goes down, or maybe I should say goes up, to addressing the needs of the most vulnerable ones. Uh, with, again, with the IFD, the French Agence for Development, uh, EU Development and Humanitarian Services, ECHO, and our partners from UNHCR, we have committed to advance the humanitarian development nexus in southwestern Uganda's refugee camp, Naki Valley and Oruchinga. Uh, we have developed a project that involves providing the settlement areas with water and sanitation services for a population of about 150,000 refugees. And we thank UNHR and NWSC for their partnership. The project also aiming at transferring responsibilities from agencies to government institutions. As I conclude, uh, I want to reiterate the commitment of the European Union to support Uganda to promote water and environment for a climate resilience development. This can only be achieved by a collective work and informed choices. This is the result of decisions we make on daily basis about climate risk reductions, emission reductions, and sustainable development. And for that, I subscribe about what was said by Rose. Uh, it's not about population, it's mainly about what we do as a population on our environments. 
And this shows also, I mean, the discussion we had today show uh, the close and complex interactions of all sectors to contribute to the development of the country from a sustainable manner. This is why such water and environment week are so important here in Uganda, but also in Europe, where we all do this type of week. And we praise Uganda for its engagement on these issues of global importance. Thank you very much. I will personally not attempt to try and pronounce your name. Morris already did that better, so I will not try to do that again. And to also not take a lot of uh, time on that, allow me to invite our next speaker, because our TV time is almost done and we need this captured. I invite the UNHCR representative in Uganda, Mr. Matthew Krenzel. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes to speak to us. I also do hope I didn't murder any of your names, because at least they were simpler than the one Morris pronounced. Honorable uh, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Water and Environment, Honorable Senior Members of Government, uh, Deputy Head of EU Delegation, Head of Mission of the Austria Mission, um, Directors, Members of the Panel, um, Distinguished uh, Ladies and Gentlemen, I hope um, all protocols have been observed here. I'm not going to be long. Um, it has been a, a week of very intense uh, discussions, deliberations on a subject which is uh, dear to the hearts of many of us here. Um, we have overwhelming expertise on the subject here, so I would not even be touching on, on those areas. Just to um, acknowledge uh, with uh, a lot of pride the association of the UN in general and UNHCR and the cooperation, excellent cooperation that we have with the ministry of water and environment. I'm going to talk about a subject which I believe may not have been talked uh, about much uh, in, the, in the course of the week. That is the subject of refugees and the impact that refugees have had on and the environment here in, uh, in Uganda. At such occasions, I always take advantage of it to acknowledge um, and also to thank the government of Uganda for the very generous asylum policy, the best in Africa and probably the best, or one of the best in the world. <laughs> Whereby the government offers open doors for, it, for all persons fleeing conflict in the region. And this is a testament, a testam uh, testament of um, the, the, the security that Uganda has been able to maintain in a region that is very, very chaotic. Many of the people uh, are around uh, the country or in, in the sub-region, when they want to seek refuge, Uganda is a popular destination. No wonder why Uganda hosts the highest number of refugees in Africa and the third highest number of refugees in the world. So once again, with a lot of gratitude to the government of Uganda for maintaining its policy, open door policy, thereby allowing people to come in and not come and live in refugee camps, but to come and live in what we call settlements. No restrictions of movements. Refugees are well integrated, um, have access to the basic services like Ugandans do have. The only thing they cannot do is to vote, is not to vote. Uh, other than that, this is exemplary. Haven't been in the organization for a long time, I can attest to this. It is not the same elsewhere. Um, sometimes when you, you have something in abundance, you take it for granted. But this is really commendable for Uganda to maintain its open doors uh, to refugees. Currently, we have more than 1.5 million refugees um, in the country. And by the end of this year, uh, the number is estimated to reach 1.6 million the majority of them coming from South Sudan and also from um, DRC. 
Last year alone, we had nearly 150,000 new arrivals coming in. As we speak today, this year, more than 16,000 have come in, and it never stops. So you can imagine the pressure that they put on the environment and the basic services that um, are existent in the host communities and even in the transit districts. That is why we are very happy uh, to be associated with the Ministry of Water and Environment in ensuring that one basic service that is fundamental for all, and that has been the cause of conflicts in many parts of the world, as was mentioned, you, you, I'm sure you heard it uh, during the panel discussions, water has been a source of conflicts in many parts of the world. But thanks to the collaboration that we have had with the, the Ministry of Water and Environment and other partners, uh, this has not happened, at least to the best of my knowledge, in Uganda. It's something that we don't have to take for granted at all. The impact of such new arrivals cannot be um, underestimated at all. Uh, the impact on the environment is real, and we feel it in the in the refugee settlements. Last year, uh, floods destroyed about a thousand family latrines in uh, Palorinha and uh, Ajubani settlements, costing more than one million to rehabilitate them. This is just a small example of what the environment is doing uh, in, in the refugee settlements. But I must also underscore the exemplary collaboration between UNHCR and the government of Ghana, which is reflected in the Joint Water and Environment Sector Response Plan, which has been able to leverage development partners' funding to support infrastructural development in refugee hosting districts. Over the years, as I'm talking of over the, the last few years, probably four or five years, um, more than 140 million uh, euros uh, have been uh, committed from development partners like the World Bank, KFW, AFD, EU, Danida, GIZ, and others to build permanent infrastructure benefiting both refugees and the host communities. Of all the sectors that provide basic services in Uganda, and this I say it with some caution, but proud to say that probably where we have achieved from the refugee host community integration point of view, where we have achieved the most success is in the water sector. In January 2018, 37% of all water to refugee uh, hosting areas or refugee settlements uh, was done th through water tracking. As we speak now, you may just imagine where we stand. Less than 1% of water supplied is uh, done through water tracking. And we are very confident that this is going to go even low, lower than that. Actually, the, the, the exact figure is about 0.3% uh, of water tracking, uh, which is quite unprecedented, considering the very large areas where we have refugee settlements. Those who know it, those who have visited, um, know what I'm talking about. Hundreds of kilometers spread over um, the whole of, practically the whole of Southwest, West Nile, and in the North. So this is not an, a, a mean achievement. And here I would like to mention uh, a subject which probably we have not talked about much. As a result of Uganda's very generous asylum policy, uh, Uganda has been invited to, uh, as a co-convener um, in what we call the Global Refugee Forum, which will be attended by all member states, but as co-convener, and there are only six co-conveners, as co-convener, Uganda has been invited at the highest level, which means His Excellency um, President Museveni has been invited, and I'm pleased to inform you that he has accepted in writing that he's going to participate in that. Leading up to the Global Refugee Forum, there are going to be a number of roundtable discussions. Some of you will recall that on the 28th of February, the roadmap towards the launch, uh, towards the Global Refugee for Forum was launched in Uganda. And we had a team uh, from Geneva to come and support us. And I'm also proud to say that the team acknowledged that of all the six co-conveners, preparations in Uganda are far ahead of all the other co-convening countries. 
and as a key activity towards uh, the Global Refugee Forum, there are going to be round tables to discuss on pledges that um, participating countries, and particularly co-convening uh, co countries, will be making um, at the forum. It is the biggest platform of, on which refugee matters are discussed, taking place between 13th and 15th of December. Um, and it will be um, an honor to showcase good examples of integration of basic services for refugees and host communities. And since in the water sector we have achieved the highest uh, level of integration, I think it will be very, very useful for the um, Ministry of Water and Environment to get fully vested in the roundtable discussions, which will be preparing Uganda's case for His Excellency, the President uh, of Uganda, to present, to make a case at the Global Refugee Forum. The main purpose of making the case is to galvanize support for the refugee uh, program here in Uganda, and also to showcase the example of uh, uh, management of refugees, uh, which Uganda, of which Uganda is, is leading. Uh, since 2018, uh, UNHCR has put in place what we call the Global Compact on Refugees, where refugee management is an all-society approach, and it was inspired by the example of Uganda. So there is a lot at stake for us here in our preparations towards the Global Refugee Forum to be able to showcase what has been achieved here in Uganda, particularly in uh, the water sector. We are lagging behind a little bit, or probably significantly, in, on the environment side of things, even though um, I'm also happy to note that over the past four or five years, uh, together or in collaboration with the government and the district, um, districts hosting um, uh, refugees, over eight million trees have been planted. But I know this is not enough. Uh, there is a lot more to be done there. Now the question is, all these achievements that have been made, how do we sustain these achievements? Yes, integration has taken place um, in terms of water uh, systems. We have still not gotten to uh, the, the standard um, of uh, number of liters of uh, water per person in all the settlements but we are making very, very significant advances uh, towards that. So we have to underscore this achievement whilst um, also highlighting what is left to sustain the achievements made lest we lose a momentum. As the water, uh, uh, the water, and sanit water sanitation and hygiene sector of the refugee response plan is maturing, there is the new need to per, uh, pursue innovative financing options that goes beyond the orthodox uh, donors. Climate-related funding options such as carbon credits, private sector and corporate social responsibilities of companies and agencies need to be engaged to support the government of Uganda's efforts in ensuring sustainable protection for refugees in Uganda. Finally, I would like to commend the leadership of the Ministry of Water and Environment in coordinating the implementation of the Water and Environment Response Plan. I understand over 40 percent of the total budget of 900 million thereabout has been uh, obtained. I hope this would increase after the UN Water Conference and associated commitments. I would also want to uh, like to reiterate the UN's unflinching support to the government of Uganda in its development of sustainable water provision to its citizens and others, including refugees, whilst ensuring that the environment is well protected. Thank you. Surely we can do better. Another round of applause. Um, we will now very shortly invite the ministry to speak to us and formally close uh, this week-long uh, week. Uh, as 
the UNHCR country representative was speaking and he spoke to the water, UN Water Conference. Uh, we are excited uh, that Uganda will have a delegation to the Water Conference uh, and, we'll look, and, and the timing of the water and environment we couldn't have been better because you, you literally pick the recommendations from here and carry them to New York. So we are very excited that uh, we've helped you with the, your homework. In fact, I think you need to pay all of us who came, uh, Dr. Kalist, because you decided you wanted information, you invited us for one week and we provided the necessary information you're taking to the UN uh, next week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf uh, of the ministry, uh, it gives me pleasure to invite uh, the Permanent Secretary, who is here representing the Minister, to come and officially close this week-long uh, Water and Environment Week. May we put our hands together for the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Water. Thank you, Maurice and Mildred, for the wonderful job. First and foremost, apologies. I should not have been the one doing this function, but as faith would have it, I'm bestowed on this very big responsibility. There is a special cabinet meeting that is happening and I was hoping that uh, our guest of honor would be here with us but uh, I was advised just uh, 30 minutes ago that it is not going to be possible therefore I'm going to proceed on behalf of the guests of honor so let me wear is it do, do you call it hat or the <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the shoes? No. The shoes, I can't walk in stilettos. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> yes. So the A Deputy Head of Delegation of the European Union, Uganda, Mr. Guillaume Chatain, the UNHCR resident representative in Uganda, Mr. Matthew, Prenzel, the head of uh, Ocean Delegation in Uganda, Dr. Roswitha, the District Governor, Honorable Sebalo, the representatives of development partners, the managing directors and executive directors, Apologies, Chairman of UNMA, you take precedence above that. The private sector and civil society organizations represented here. The panelists, the youth, all the stakeholders, officials from government, agencies, ministries, and my very own staff from the Minister of Water and Environment, the media, ladies and gentlemen. Before I give the chief guest speech, I think let me respond to what my very good friend Ross, the youth ambassador for climate change for Uganda, talked about. On the side of the curriculum development, we had discussions actually with the youth and this is one of the things they put across and we have had engagements and destruction and there's development. I cannot go into details, but at an opportune moment, we should be able to see that happening. On the side of negotiations, we now embed the youth as part of our negotiators. And uh, we have also started engagement with our development partners, especially to build their capacity so that they understand the nationally determined contribution the Climate Change Act, the National Adaptation Plans, ETC, so that they can effectively negotiate with us. And my challenge to them is that this should not be a youth affair of Kampala, but a national youth movement. But I'm very confident they'll deliver on that. 
back to the speech. It is my honor and pleasure to officiate at the closing of the 6th Uganda Water and Environment Week 2023. I wish to congratulate you all for successfully completing a full week of activities that included dialogue, technical presentations, applied training courses, field visits, and various site events, among others. I wish to applaud the leadership of, and staff of the Ministry of Water and Environment and the various partners for organizing this event and bringing together all the key stakeholders to dialogue on issues affecting the sector and the country at large. Ladies and gentlemen, water and environment resources are connectors and catalysts and are a key resource in the socioeconomic development process of Uganda. Water and environment resources are key for peace, stability at the local, national, and international levels and for climate resilient development. Thus, the need to secure the country requires partnership and capacity building amongst the various stakeholders and states. Ladies and gentlemen, Uganda has over the last few years been facing challenges related to climate change and environmental degradation. The loss of forests and wetlands through massive use of biomass fuel for cooking, combustion, combined with other drivers, which include but not limited to agricultural land, rapid urbanization, have put a lot of pressure on water and environment resources. Thus, the conservation of water and environment resources needs urgent attention and the interventions should aim at creating incomes and assets for the people as well as provision of education to communities. Safe drinking water and adequate sanitation and hygiene are pillars of human health and well-being. However, access to safe water in rural and urban areas of Uganda is still low and stands at 69 and 71% respectively. Access to water and sanitation services therefore need to be given priority by the sector through doing business unusual. Ladies and gentlemen, issues of partnership and intersectoral coordination among other issues have been highlighted as being critical. There is therefore a need to optimize partnerships and harness the synergies amongst stakeholders such as the private sector, religious institutions, cultural institutions, the NGOs, academia, and other government agencies. I'm therefore happy to note that the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2023 has given priority to active participation of all these key stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, from the summary report that has just been presented, deliberations of this week have reaffirmed the dependency of the country on environment, environmental and natural resources to deliver water, environmental and natural resources, goods and services, and to ensure climate resilient development. Thus, the management of water and environment resources is critical for climate resilient development of Uganda. This, however, requires strategic partnership, adequate capacity, and enough financial resources which are currently limited. I therefore request the sector players to strengthen partnership and collaboration with the Minister of Water and Environment to identify innovative options for financing the sector, including utilizing the available resources efficiently and effectively. I pledge the commitment of government to continue prioritizing issues of water, environment, and climate change and ensure adequate financial resources are mobilized. Ladies and gentlemen, I request you all to internalize the outcomes and recommendations of the 6th Uganda Water and Environment Week and use them to drive the water and environment sector so that it supports the delivery of wealth creation and employment agenda of the government of Uganda. 
I wish to assure you of government's commitment to have recommendations of the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2023 implemented. I wish to appreciate the support of the various organizations and development partners that have continued to provide the technical and financial resources to the Ministry of Water and Environment and other sector players to deliver water and environment services to the people of Uganda. On behalf of the Government of Uganda, I wish to thank you for your support and contributions, without which the critical sector of government would not have managed to deliver on its mandate effectively. I would like to thank the organizers for putting up this very wonderful Six Water and Environment Week, Dialogue and all the activities. I would like to single out the youth for your active participation and the non-state actors for the lively contribution you have made. It is now my honor to formally declare the Six Uganda Water and Environment Week close for God and my country. On on behalf of the third Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you. So I noticed even after he read, uh, the hand clap was for the Permanent Secretary. So can we put a better hand clap for the Chief of, uh, our guest of honor? Uh, so that even while in Entebbe, she can hear us. Huh? OK. Um, so very quickly, two things will happen. We have a short clip we, we, we are going to run. But to officially mark the closure, uh, the chief guest and our partners will uh, gracefully cut this cake. Um, someone was thinking it's a trophy for somebody. No, it's a, it's a cake uh, for us today. So allow me to um, uh, speak to this, that Uganda will be hosting the 7th Nile Basin Development Forum this October 2023 in Kampala. This conference will bring all the 10 Nile Basin countries together to provide a platform for exchange of knowledge, ideas, experience from the Nile Basin countries. And the ministry, together with the Nile Basin Initiative Secretariat based in Entebbe, will coordinate the organization of this very important conference. We call upon all sectors, our partners and friends, to join the organization in hosting when called upon. As you may know, Uganda's surface water resource uh, almost wholly transboundary, and 98% of Uganda's land cover falls within the Nile Basin. So may we have that video, please. NBI and the Government of Uganda, through the Ministry of Water and Environment, are pleased to announce that the seventh edition of the Nile Basin Development Forum will take place in October 2023 in Kampala, Uganda. Measuring 6,695 kilometers in length, the Nile River is the world's longest river and its drainage basin covers 11 African countries. The Nile Basin is home to 272 million people, while the total population of the Nile countries is 529 million people. The Nile Basin countries face numerous challenges, including inadequate availability, unsustainable use, and poor management of water resources. These challenges are exacerbated by climate change, which represents a serious threat to water security 